Okay. Uh, which one do I press to turn this on? What's up? Nothing coming up. There we go. You have to open the other shield that goes in it. It's open. Okay, <laughs> so we'll, uh, we'll continue watching the Lord as he makes his tapestry and uh, as he's putting that together. And so he has part of it finished uh, in what we've been looking at, uh, but still some to go. And so uh, last night, as we finished, uh, we were just mentioning uh, that this now forms the basis for everything that would follow in the scripture. And we're going to look at it in a little bit of detail and see a little bit more about it. But before we do that, let's just read some verses together. So uh, Genesis 12 and uh, verses 2 and 3. I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. In verse 7, And the Lord appeared unto Abram, and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord, who appeared unto him. And chapter 13, and verse 14, and the Lord said unto Abram, after that Lot was separated from him, lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. And chapter 15, and chapter 15, uh, verse 5, and he brought him forth abroad and said, look now toward heaven and count the stars, and if thou be able to number them, he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. And verse 18. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. And so what we started to look at and what these verses have to do with is uh, this covenant that God was going to make with, or that God made with Abram. And uh, this is, as we mentioned last night, one in which God is the one responsible in this legal agreement uh, to fulfill the conditions of the covenant. Abram is a passive receiver of the covenant uh, and of the uh, things that are promised in the covenant. So, of course, we saw God's promises, first of all, and then chapter 15, we see the actual making of that covenant. And the covenant, as we look at it, and as we go through Scripture, we find it has these three particular elements uh, that God promised in the covenant. And so one of them is land, and then seed and blessing. And we'll look at those. We're not going to go through Deuteronomy 29 to 30, but you've already heard, as we read, uh, God promising land. And in the last verse we read, in verse 18 in chapter 15, that land would stretch from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. And so uh, when we see uh, God's uh, promise of this land, it's uh, fairly extensive. And uh, to this particular point in history, uh, that land has never been fully occupied by, uh, by Israel. There was a time when... Uh, a lot of it was occupied, and that was under Solomon. But even then, it didn't belong, uh, as far as the world was concerned, it didn't belong to Israel. Rather, uh, some of the nations that were in that land were simply 
taxpayers to Solomon. In other words, Solomon had some sort of rule over them, a governorship over them, if you like, and they paid taxes. And so Israel uh, controlled a fair bit of the land, but they didn't necessarily own all that they controlled. And so uh, if God is not to be a liar, and if he is not to break a legal agreement, there is still a day coming when he has to provide all of that land to the nation Israel. And uh, we'll see that that is all involved as the Lord establishes his kingdom. Then uh, we see the seed, and let's just go to 2 Samuel. And you'll notice as we read the verses that it talked about Abraham's seed uh, being greater than the number of the stars. Uh, but uh, we have to think in terms of uh, the various categories, if we could call it that, of the seed of Abraham. There is the seed of Abraham, which is his physical descendants. That's the Jewish people. And so they are the ones that the Lord promised would be uh, more numerous than the stars. And then there's you and I who have come to faith in the Lord Jesus and in the New Testament. We are also regarded in that sense as the spiritual seed of Abraham. Uh, but then there is also the seed uh, that we'll look at in a little bit. And the seed, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ. But here is, if you like, a subsection to the Abrahamic covenant that all comes out of that covenant that God made. And uh, in 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 12, uh, the Lord is speaking to David. And it says in verse 12, When thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I, and by the way, as we go through, through this, look at the words, I will. This is a commitment from God. I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels. So initially Solomon, of course, and I will establish his kingdom. And he shall build a house for my name, which of course Solomon did. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Because as in many things, we have somewhat of a double fulfillment. Uh, first of all, the near fulfillment in Solomon building a house, but eventually the Lord who will build his temple in Jerusalem when he establishes his kingdom. He says, I will be his father and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I'll chasten him with the rod of man, of course, uh, Solomon, and with the stripes of the children of man. But my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And then notice in verse 16, thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever. So back up in verse 13, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And now in verse 16, thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. And so uh, the theologians then like to call this the Davidic covenant. And it is restated in a number of places in the scriptures <coughs> in various ways. And so there is, again, this uh, covenant from God, the promise from God that there would be a king forever uh, on David's throne. And uh, again, uh, today there is no king on David's throne. Uh, so we are still looking at a future fulfillment of this promise. And then the blessing, if we go to Jeremiah and thir chapter 31, And uh, here it says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And uh, Warren has referred a number of times to Hebrews 8, verse 8, which is uh, basically a quotation of this verse. And it says there, For... 
Finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I shall make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And so note that it doesn't say anything about the church because the church is not in the Old Testament. And even when it's quoted in the New Testament, uh, it's still talking about Israel and Judah. Israel, the northern kingdom, and Judah, the southern kingdom. And so this is a very Jewish thing. This is God dealing with his nation, Israel. And it says in verse 32 in Jeremiah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it on their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. And so, a wonderful promise. And uh, we, when we get further in the scriptures, we will see how we fit into this. Uh, and how we gain the benefits of the new covenant. Because again... That's what we live in, isn't it? It's the New Testament, the New Covenant. And so we'll see later how we fit into this. So, again, just to emphasize, with regard to this covenant, this is an unconditional covenant. Unconditional. God didn't put any conditions. He said, he doesn't say to Abraham, if you do this, then you will get this. There's no conditions. It's simply a covenant that God enters into and says, this is all yours, and you own it. The nation of Israel owns it. And so as we gave the illustration last night, it's like somebody depositing a whole bunch of money in your account, and you own it. Your only question is going to be, how do I access it? And that's what we'll see in a little bit. Now, God works in the context of the of the time in which he's working with a nation or with a people. And so this particular uh, covenant uh, falls into uh, what would have been common in that day, known as a royal grant treaty, a royal grant treaty. And the idea of a royal grant treaty is a royal grant requires no action on the part of the beneficiary. So Abraham didn't have to do anything. It is an unconditional promise given from one party to another. So the idea, what they call it a royal grant, is the idea of a king deciding that he is going to benefit uh, someone who is uh, not on the same level as him, but someone who is on a lower level and he is going to benefit them, uh, and so it's a royal grant. Now, uh, when you get grants, even in our day, for instance, uh, many grants are given uh, to help organizations, and often when we think of a grant, again, it's something that the organization doesn't have to pay back. Often, sometimes there are those, but that's the idea. And the idea is that it is from the uh, good heart of the one who is giving and he decides that this person or these people should have something and so he simply gives it to them. And that's exactly what God does in the Abrahamic covenant. And so it's a royal grant treaty. And this royal grant treaty, I'll just go back here for a moment. The royal grant treaty uh, is something that gives Ownership. I want to emphasize that word again. It's ownership. So Abram and his descendants now own this. It's been given to them. They're not required to do anything to get it. God simply gives it to them. 
course, he's going to work out his purposes through the nation. And you'll notice here I mentioned that it has a conditional blessing. And that's what we'll get into a little later. But this grant itself is unconditional. There's no strings attached. So this royal grant that is given a promised <coughs> land. And the land that was promised is from the Euphrates in the north, uh, right down to a river in Egypt. And that is the land that Israel has never <coughs> fully possessed. Keep that word possessed in mind also. Uh, it'll come up again. Now, Israel, uh, in Joshua's conquest <coughs> of the land, uh, to call Joshua's conquest a conquest really isn't accurate either because he was supposed to take the whole land, wasn't he? But uh, they didn't. There were some parts that they left. Uh, the Gibeonites tricked them into uh, uh, not relinquishing a part, but at least uh, not occupying a part. And so this land is still to be given by God. Well, it's given, but occupied by Israel eventually. And then uh, in the scriptures, when you come to the scriptures in the Old Testament, again, this idea that they didn't possess the whole land on these occasions, I think there's nine of them. Two of them are about the same incident, so they're together. Uh, and uh, you'll find in the Old Testament it talks about from Dan to Beersheba. In fact, the very last one, Chronicles, is from Beersheba to Dan. But it's all the same area, and that came to be a phrase that designated the part of Israel that they pretty much uh, uh, recognized as having been occupied and controlled. You'll notice today that that same area is pretty much the area that is under pressure from the world around today. And that area called Judea and Samaria is the area that the world calls the West Bank because they don't want to call it Judea and Samaria because that's a biblical term and they know in their hearts that God owns that land and uh, they are meddling with it. And if Israel was to give up Judea and Samaria as the world wants them to, they would have a 10 mile stretch from a uh, uh, east-west stretch here and going along here, uh, basically an area that makes them totally uh, subject to any enemy because they couldn't defend themselves in that little strip. And as well as that, uh, they can be easily cut off from the north of Israel to the south of Israel. And so again, uh, as we think about Israel in this day, and I'll show you a slide later, uh, maybe not today, we'll see if we get to it. And you'll see on that slide green, which is the Islamic nations, and they're all around. And you can't even see the little red dot in the middle, which is Israel. And the world says, well, if Israel just gives that up, there will be peace. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, so that's just an aside. But this is God moving forward, and that's the land that he has promised. And then he has promised a seed, and he has a specific seed in mind. And we see that in Galatians 13, or 3, verse 16, where it says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. And Paul says, He saith not unto seeds as of many. He's not talking about the Jewish people, but he's talking about one particular Jew, but as of one and to thy seed, which is Christ. And so the uh, promises of God have to do with the Lord Jesus, and they're all centered in him. This uh, idea of the new covenant, John Heading, in uh, his commentary, He's speaking about Matthew 26, uh, verses 27 to 29, and that's where the Lord, where it's recorded in Matthew that the Lord uh, instituted the Lord's Supper. And so he says, the reference to the blood of the New Testament is important for it stands in contrast to the blood of the Passover lamb relating to the Old Covenant. 
In Jeremiah 31, 31, that we just looked at a moment ago, the promised new covenant was to be made with Judah and Israel. It was therefore a promise for the future when unconditionally God's law would be written in their hearts and when they all would know God. However, no information was provided in Jeremiah 31 as to how this new covenant was to be inaugurated. Hebrews 9.15 to 10.18 shows that it is by blood or death, this being the basis for the putting into effect of a will, because you'll remember there in chapter 9 of Hebrews, it talks about the testator, etc., and you have to have the death of the testator. For a testament is a force, or a will is a force after men are dead, Hebrews 9.17. Only in the upper room did the Lord reveal that his blood enables the provisions of the new covenant to be put into effect, this being future for Israel, but present for us, since his blood is shed for many for the remission of sins. So what a wonderful privilege that we have, that what God has promised to the nation of Israel, that will be an absolute reality for them, as a nation, and keep making this distinction, you have to think of Israel as a nation and then individual Jews, okay? You can't confuse the two. And so as a nation, God will put his law in their hearts, but it is when the kingdom is established. So we're still looking future. So all that Abrahamic covenant has not been fulfilled yet. There's little portions, you get glimpses of it here and there, but in its full fulfillment, it won't be fulfilled until the Lord returns to the earth. But in the meantime, you and I have the privilege of being part of this new covenant Mm -hmm. by blood, by redemption, the Lord Jesus. We'll talk more about that later. So here's the three issues. Uh, First of all, the seed, and then, uh, or sorry, the land, and then the seed, and then the blessing. As I say, they're all unfulfilled as yet. So now we're moving from dispensation number four, which is the dispensation of promise, and we're moving into dispensation number five, which is the law. And so God is going to deal with Moses, and through Moses, he will give the law. And you'll notice there uh, in uh, Randy's chart, up at the top, I will give thee a law and commandments, Israel, we will do, or cursing, and we'll get to that. And then down below, it says the covenant of commandments, blessing, or cursing, broke the word in book and body, destruction of temples and nation, and return and gospel to the Jew first. So we'll get to those things as we go along. So why did the Lord choose Israel? Well, he didn't want them to get big-headed. And of course, when we see uh, them in the New Testament, they're big-headed, aren't they? Uh, I mean, Mike, Mike referred to that last night. Uh, when the Jews said, hey, we've never been in uh, captivity to anybody. (laughs) Well, they got a little big-headed. The Lord didn't want them to get big-headed, so he says, you are a holy people that is separated to the Lord. Unto the Lord thy God, the Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you because you were more in number. For you were the fewest of all people. Isn't that what the Lord still does? Doesn't he always deal with the remnant? <laughs> Doesn't he deal with the, the weak and the incapable? And then he displays his glory, as we see in 1 Corinthians in the first couple of chapters, through those that are incapable, and he brings his purposes to pass, and he receives the glory. And God says, it's because the Lord loved you and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. 
And so again, uh, just like Israel, we've been loved of the Lord and we've been brought out of Egypt out of sin. So now we are dealing with the Mosaic Covenant, which we generally call the law. And uh, we, of course, get uh, much of the law in Exodus 19 through 24. And uh, it goes on in Exodus to expand it even more with all of those regulations that were mentioned. I forget the number, uh, 600 and something, wasn't it? And so uh, we are dealing with what God has given and uh, in what he has given, he has uh, encapsulated it in, in the Ten Words, the Ten Commandments. So when we come to this particular covenant with God, it is different from the Abrahamic covenant. In this particular case, again, it is uh, uh, what was common in the day. It's called a suzerain vassal covenant. So what's a suzerain vassal covenant? I'm just going to read a definition of suzerain for you, and you'll begin to see what it's all about. Uh, for instance, uh, one uh, definition for suzerain is a nation that controls another nation in international affairs, but allows it domestic sovereignty. So it has to do with control. Second definition, a feudal lord to whom fealty was due. In other words, think about the Middle Ages and there's the lord of the manor and the people who live there have an obligation to the lord of the manor. A feudal lord or baron, a lord paramount, etc. So that's a suzerain. And so the suzerain uh, is one who is of rank and uh, who has control of uh, people below him in rank. And uh, the vassal, let's get the vassal. You know, if you grew up in England, you would know what these, uh, you, you know what a vassal is. Oh, it doesn't want to open that page for me. <laughs> a vassal uh, is basically uh, the plebs, the ones down below that owe something to the suzerain. In other words, it's the Lord and the people, okay? So that's the type of, uh, that is the type of covenant that we have here. In fact, the whole of the book of Deuteronomy is a suzerain vassal treaty. There's six parts to a suzerain vassal treaty. And so in Deuteronomy, you have chapter one, one to five, so that's the preamble, you know, say a few things at the beginning to introduce it. And then you have the prologue where it talks about it a little more, what it's going to be about. Deuteronomy chapter 1, 6 through 440. Don't need to remember all this. I just want you to be aware that this Mosaic Covenant is in this format that was common in the day. And then thirdly, there's the covenant obligations. So Deuteronomy 5 through 26, you have the obligations. And then there's some storage and reading instructions and a few uh, scattered verses. And then there's witnesses to the treaty. That's in Deuteronomy 32, verse 1. And then the part that uh, is going to be very significant with regard to the Mosaic Covenant, and that is the blessings and curses. Every suzerain vassal treaty had blessings and curses. And so basically, those who were vassals, they were agreeing to come under the protective custody of the suzerain, and in return, he would give blessings. But if they stepped outside the conditions of the treaty, then there would be curses that kicked in. And that's exactly what we see in God's dealing with Israel in the Mosaic Covenant. And so the suzerain, who in this case is God, he promises blessing or cursing conditional on the vassal demonstrating loyalty or disloyalty by obedience or disobedience. So, with the Abrahamic covenant, Israel has ownership. And we ask the question, how do they make the most of their ownership? How do they get the blessings of the ownership in practice? 
it's no good that $2 million sitting in the bank. How do I get it out of the bank and use it? And this is the way you get it out of the bank and use it, okay? through the Mosaic Covenant. And the Mosaic Covenant, uh, as you uh, look at it and as you uh, go through it, this covenant, where God sets out all the benefits and then eventually gets to the blessings and cursings that are at the end of Leviticus and the end of Deuteronomy. And uh, you'll notice, uh, as you look at those blessings and cursings, that the blessings are wonderful. I mean, you, you would think if the Israelites read this every day, they would say, there's absolutely no way I'm going to disobey God. Because look at all that the Lord was going to do for them. Blessed uh, be thou in the city, blessed be thou in the field, blessed shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of the ground and the fruit of the cattle and the increase of your animals and the flocks and your sheep. Blessed your basket and your store, blessed shall you be when you come in and, and when you go out and the Lord will cause your enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before your face. They'll come out against thee one way and flee before thee seven ways. I mean, this is wonderful stuff. And uh, when you read it, you have blessings that are about this long, but what wonderful blessings they are. But then you get to the cursings. And in verse 15, and the, ble the blessings are this much, and the cursings are this much. And everything that happened to Israel after the giving of the law, you can trace it right back to these curses. God is faithful as the suzerain, the one in power, the one who said, I will protect you, but here's the conditions. And if you fulfill every condition, you can have the Abrahamic covenant. You can draw it all out of the bank and get everything. But of course, they couldn't keep the law, could they? And you and I can't keep the law. And so, again, they've never enjoyed the Abrahamic covenant, the blessings of that covenant. And so, we're, with the Abrahamic covenant, the key word was ownership. With the Mosaic covenant, it all has to do with possessing and enjoying. There's ownership. Those conditions of the Abrahamic covenant will never change. And when it comes down to it, with regard to the Mosaic covenant, God has given it to demonstrate that they cannot keep the law. And therefore, when the Lord Jesus Christ came, he was the only one who ever kept the law. And uh, in its totality. And it's on the basis of that and of his, his sacrifice in Calvary and that then eventually Israel will not only uh, have ownership of the things that were promised, land, seed, and blessing, but they will also practically possess and enjoy them. And that's what we'll see when we get to the millennium as God through the Lord Jesus Christ, brings all this into reality. So the Mosaic Covenant is a conditional covenant. The Abrahamic Covenant is unconditional. God just says, this is yours. But this covenant is conditional. And how do we know that? Well, if uh, you look back at chapter 28, uh, it says in verse 2, if if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. And in uh, verse 15, if thou wilt not hearken. So it's conditional. And uh, actually, when we go back to Exodus chapter 19, which is the beginning of the giving of the law, and look at verse 5. It says there, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then. Every time you see ifs and thens, something is conditional. 
And so God says, this is conditional. This is how you withdraw the money from the bank. But if you don't do it right, you're not getting any money out of the bank. Okay? And so again, it comes down to uh, the inability of Israel to keep the law. And eventually they needed that Messiah, that Savior, who would not only keep the law himself, uh, but as they came to faith in him and believed in him, and in him, if you like, the law is kept, and so uh, he is able to bring in the full uh, possession and enjoyment of the land seed and blessing for the nation of Israel. So, possession and blessing, enjoyment of benefits are conditional upon obedience. And so the Lord, in these verses that we just turned back to in Exodus, says, now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and you'll be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And in this is the seeds of what they were supposed to be. They were supposed to be a kingdom of priests. Who, what's a priest? A priest represents man to God. And so, again, they were supposed to be this holy nation, a set-apart nation that was an example and a challenge to the Gentile world so that their God could be displayed to the Gentile world and that they would lead the Gentiles to worship their God, which they don't do and haven't done. And so again, when we move on later and we see the church, as I mentioned last night, I believe that part of the reason for the church is that God is giving this opportunity to the Gentile nations that Israel should have provided for them in the first place. Now, what we have now is a theocratic administration. If we think back to uh, the garden, it was a theocratic administration. And uh, Adam and Eve were theocratic administrators. What does that mean? Well, we get the same sort of combination of words in our life, in uh, English that we use. We talk about democratic, and demos has to do with people, and uh, kratic comes from the Greek word that has to do with power, uh, kratos, and so uh, the idea is the power of the people. I think the most politicians have forgotten about that. But anyway, when it comes to theocratic then, Theo has to do with God. Uh, the word theos means God. And so it's the power of God. And in a theocratic administrator, therefore, would be someone who exercises authority and power, but not his own. It is God's <coughs> power and authority. And the administrator uh, has a responsibility to exercise that. So now, we have that which was lost in Eden, and in a very limited sense, we have another system in that sort of same vein, and now Moses is going to head that up for a time, and then he'll be followed, of course, by kings, uh, or by judges and kings, etc. And so uh, this uh, uh, quotation says, uh, the theocratic administrator that was lost in Eden is restored to the earth, at least in a limited sense, at Sinai. Just as God governed indirectly through Adam and Eve, God now begins to rule indirectly over Israel through his theocratic administrator, Moses. And this arrangement covered most of Old Testament history as God, even after the time of Moses, governed Israel indirectly through Joshua and then various judges, and finally Israel's various kings. And so we now have a system in place, which again is because of human beings involved, since both human beings is also not going to work out so well. Uh, and so after uh, Solomon comes to reign, uh, we see the nation divided. Well, that wasn't in God's plan, or uh, God's intention. He wanted a single nation, uh, but because of Rehoboam's uh, stupid decisions and listening to the little boys instead of the men, 
uh, he split the kingdom. And so uh, we see that in Kings and Chronicles. And as a result of that, and as a result of the continuing sin of now the two portions of the nation, uh, we see them brought to the place of God's judgment. And so the northern ten tribes, they are brought under judgment by Assyria. Now, where's Assyria? Right up north, right? Up above, if we had the map up, up above Babylon, etc. Mm -hmm. Who's the originator up there? Nimrod. Yeah, exactly. So now those things that are set way back in the early days of the earth after the flood, uh, they are now coming to bite uh, later on. And Assyria is used of God to come against the northern kingdom and uh, the people from that kingdom, from, of which Samaria is the capital, they are taken and they're distributed all over uh, the Assyrian Empire. It's not like later with Judah, where they are taken as captives into Babylon. The Jewish people in the northern kingdom were simply spread around uh, the Assyrian Empire. And then the land was refilled by uh, the king uh, with people from various parts of the empire. Basically, he took all the dregs and put them into, into uh, northern Israel. And so uh, if we had time to do it, we'd go and we'd see uh, that they were having issues and uh, with worship, etc. And uh, the king brought uh, priests back from captivity or from being spread around the empire back to instruct these people who are now in Israel. And as a result of all of that, we won't go into the details, but that's where the Samaritans come from. And so we have the Samaritans now resident in uh, Israel, in the northern part. And of course, uh, one of the first people that the Lord Jesus reaches in his ministry is that Samaritan woman by the well. So we have this going on, and this enables us, if you like, to jump over quite a bit of history. And we're getting close to the New Testament, but we're not there yet. And so now we have this theocracy uh, where God is ruling uh, through, I think I have one minute left, uh, ruling through a designate, whether that designate is Moses or a judge or a king. And that is brought to an end at Babylon because uh, uh, Judah survived another number of years after the northern kingdom, and then Nebuchadnezzar came and took Judah into captivity, into Babylon. So uh, when we look at the next session, we're going to briefly look at Daniel and his prophecies, because that brings us up to that, and it moves God's tapestry. It's filling in much more of God's tapestry, and God is going to set the stage for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, that's where we are as God moves through. And the other thing to know about uh, this time, uh, Moses to Babylon, we're still in dispensation number five. <clears throat> we'll get to it in a few moments. But this is a time that will now be called the times of the Gentiles. And we'll look at that this evening in the session then. But the times of the Gentiles, beginning uh, when Nebuchadnezzar does his work and continuing until the end of the tribulation. And it is a time when there is no king on the throne of the nation of Israel. And it is a time when the Gentile nations, if you like, trample upon Israel. And so, of course, we're seeing that in a very real sense today. So let's stop there, and tonight we'll continue on. Let's just pray, and then you can ask questions or challenge or whatever. But let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. 
We thank you for your faithfulness. And Lord, as you set this foundation of covenants in place on which, uh, which will determine your actions in the future and will also determine, Father, uh, what occurs with Israel and eventually what happens with the church. Father, we just ask uh, that you would bring these things home to us and help us to see your hand in all things. Father, we know that you're not a puppet master. We have wills, but Father, somehow you take <coughs> the decisions and the actions of our wills and of the wills of everyone down through history. And you take them and you weave them all together, Father, to produce this beautiful tapestry of your purposes. And Father, you uh, work it all out for one reason, and that is to exalt thy son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Father, as we come to you, we again bow in wonder at your greatness, at your, one, at your mercy, at your loving kindness, and even, Father, when you bring discipline, uh, you always remember mercy. And so, Father, we just praise you and thank you in all things. Continue with us now, we would ask in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. You might as well start with our role. And, um, the, uh, you mentioned about the seed of Abraham. Uh -huh. And of course, there's this thing about also the fact that uh, he was promised that he would have descendants as numerous as the sand on the sea or the stars in the heaven. Yep. I just had always heard that uh, the distinction was being made between his earthly seed, which would be this descend on the seashore, yes. and then stars in heaven would be the heavenly seed. No, I think that's. Uh, I don't see a problem with that sort of look at things. Yeah. It's actually when God affirmed the covenant with Isaac, he only mentions the stars in heaven, and when he affirms yep. the covenant with Jacob, it's only seen as a seed, so that would give yep. credence to that thing. Yep. Yep. I had uh, just two thoughts to uh, kind of further illustrate this thought of the law being a conditional covenant. You mentioned when the kingdom is split, and we have the ten tribes going north and the two tribes in the South. Yeah. The disobedience in the days of Joshua and making uh, a covenant with the Gibeonites, mm -hmm. those four cities, the foreigners, as you said, they, they possessed the land, but they didn't occupy that section, and that became the soft point, yeah. and that's exactly where the kingdom broke. Right. Their disobedience led to the break in the kingdom, and that's the nature of the law. Wherever they didn't obey, it cost them. Yeah. And then in Deuteronomy, 28, uh, 27, Moses says, when Joshua leads you in the land, you're, you're to go to um, this, this place, it's Shechem, half the tribes on Gerizim, half the tribes on mm -hmm. Mount Ebal, and the blessings and the curses of the law should be read. Mm -hmm. And so the good tribes were on Gerizim, and the, um, the other tribes, I shouldn't say the good tribes, there were half the tribes on Gerizim, the blessings were read, half the tribes were on evil and the curses were read. There's no evidence in scripture that the people said anything when the blessings were read. But when the curses were read, they all said amen. The place rocked. In other words, it was the unconditional nature of the law. We're responsible to obey the law and if we don't, God's going to curse us. But they can make no demands on God's grace to bless them. And that's the nature of the law. Yep. And uh, just on that point, uh, when the law is given, uh, there are a number of occasions when uh, the people say, yeah, we'll obey that, no problem. And so, uh, <clears throat> for instance, in uh, <coughs> here, certainly when it's restated in Joshua's time at the end, uh, you'll remember uh, with regard to Joshua that the people said, yeah, we'll obey. Joshua 24. And uh, Joshua actually says to them, you've just witnessed against yourself. 
And so uh, when the law is restated, people said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. And then they said, the people said unto Joshua, no, we will serve the Lord. And then it says the people, in fact, they said three times in here, the people said unto Joshua, the Lord our God, will we serve and his voice will we obey? Uh, but right when the law was being given, uh, the people also gave assent to the law. And uh, in uh, chapter <coughs> I put my finger on the on the verses. I'll find them later. But anyway, they give assent to the law and they say we will obey the law. So Yeah, that's one of them. It's chapter nineteen eight, but also over the you know, other ones I'm looking for, there's two other times uh, when they say that. But anyway, just the point is uh, that they hear these conditions and uh, they know all about the blessing and they know all about the cursing and as Warren has mentioned that they're the ones they vocalize about and yet they just go out and they bring all the curses on themselves and everything that they do so yeah. I can't help but notice uh, as we go through Israel's history when Israel did well it was because they had a good king mm -hmm. 